Now, I said we have the best minds in the industry, and I absolutely mean it. And one of those minds is Gary Kay. And I'm excited for you to hear what Gary is going to be talking about with us today. Because Gary is going to be taking us on a bit of a journey around design, AV design, but from a people-first perspective, which is more than just what the specs can do. It's what people can do with the technology. A lot of respect for Gary. You're going to love this keynote from him. So would you help me make Gary feel welcome and say, welcome, Gary Kay. That's cool, buddy. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for that introduction. A little bit about my background in case you wonder why I'm here and why I'm wearing a t-shirt and not dressed up nice like him. Um, I'm in a kind of different role here in the uh, AV industry. Um, I grew up in the AV industry. I graduated from the University of North Carolina uh, back in 1987, started working at a small company, a startup at the time named Extron. They were seven, I was the 17th employee at the company and, uh, and was there 10 years, was at AMX a couple of years and then have uh, since been doing marketing consulting and I also own a publication that writes about the industry um, called Rave Pub, which, which I'll tell you about in a bit. But I also teach at the University of North Carolina. Um, so uh, um, th th that perspective in teaching, I've been teaching for about 10 years, and, uh, and I've been teaching millennials and now Generation Z. And what struck me as something unusual is that there was a hard cut between what a millennial was and what a Generation Z was. It was really weird. Two years ago, I started having my first Generation Z students, and they were very, very different than the students from one year before. And then I thought, well, that's an anomaly. And then the next year, last year, I had my second class of Generation Z, and they were different than the, they were different than the, than the last class of millennials I had. And then this year, I had my third. So there was a real interesting split between these types of uh, students and also a big generational split between millennials and the other generations. And it dawned on me that things are changing in our industry because of these two groups of people. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. Also, I'm a user of AV. I'm also um, helping the University of North Carolina redesign our entire campus AV system because we're going all AV over IP, which I'll talk about uh, later uh, in this session. So you'll kind of know how we're going to do it, what we're going to use to do that. Um, and then, uh, and, and of course, I'll hang around and answer any questions that you might have, but I hope that you find uh, this presentation uh, interesting. Uh, so the, 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 the topic, I, I kind of wrap this up into something I call the future of AV design is a people first approach. Um, and, and I think you'll understand this as I go through this. For those of you who happen to be um, CTSers, meaning you have your, your industry CTS certification, uh, certified technology specialist, this session that I'm about to deliver is qualifies you for 1.5, even though it's only a one hour, less than a one hour session, 1.5 CTS credits for both CTS, for all three, CTS, CTSI, and CTSD. So if you have any level of CTS, you actually get those credits. The other thing I want to tell you is that we've actually created a microsite for this entire event. If you go to arraypubs.com slash AVI Live, which is what this event is called, you'll see every, pro every manufacturer, we're, at, we're going to the show floor and we're shooting videos on all the products they're, they're showing here at the show floor. So we're going to compile about 100 videos that we've shot and all the educational sessions that, that, you, that you attended, including this session, are being recorded and posted on that site, and it'll all be completed by tomorrow afternoon. So everything will be there by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, about half of it is there now because we did the first half of it last week in Minneapolis. So if you go to that site, so for those of you, and I know that for every one of you that's here, there's at least three or four of you who aren't here that should be here. Um, if you'll send them to that site, it'll be their ability to be virtually here so that next time we come back, AVI comes back to uh, Milwaukee, that they'll, they'll see the value of, of attending a show like this and, and maybe attend in the future. Now, for uh, those of you who are AVI uh, systems people in the room, do you mind raising your hand? Because I'm going to tell you something that no one in the entire world knows about AVI systems. No one in the world knows this, and no one who works for AVI systems knows this, and no one in the industry knows this because we don't officially announce this until uh, the week before Infocom, but AVI Systems won our uh, Reader's Choice Award. This is the eighth year we've been doing Reader's Choice Awards. AVI Systems has finished in the top three, 
six of the eight years, and this year they won. So congratulations to ABI Systems. Um, I don't know the total vote count, but last, the last two years we had 81,000 and, and 92,000 votes. So that's a lot of people that voted on this, so they couldn't have stuffed the ballot themselves as good as they might be. That they don't have 92,000 people working there. But, uh, but in any case, uh, for those of you in marketing and AVI systems, you cannot post that yet. You cannot tweet that yet because we have not officially announced that. I'm just telling the fine folks of Milwaukee. By the way, I am coming back to Summerfest. I had no idea what Summerfest was. And my Uber driver is like, oh, let me tell you a little bit about Milwaukee. And he says, hey, there's this thing called Summerfest. And it's like three weeks long, and there's like 400 bands. And I'm like, how did I not know anything about this? So I went on last night, and I signed up for the newsletter. And I went on today, and I bought my tickets. So I'm coming back here for Summerfest. So I'm excited. <laughs> so I've divided this presentation into, into six sections, OK? Uh, the first is products and technologies. Second is millennials versus Generation Z, where they're different. Third is millennials and Generation Z, where they're alike. And then, then I'm going to go into what difference does that make in the world of AV? Like, how does it affect AV? What do we care? Why is this even a topic? Why am I even talking about this? Because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, you're going to be like, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, and then the future, the AV's future seven, which are seven things you need to watch out for in the AV industry that are going to be affected by this group of millennials and Generation Z aging up. Uh, and then I'll have some time for some questions, hopefully, uh, depending on how much time AVI Systems gives me. So our industry has done a phenomenal job with products and technology. I'm excited to be in this industry. Um, I used to teach a class 20 years ago called The Perfect Image. I don't know if anyone attended that class, but it was a week-long class, OK? A week-long, five-day class that taught you how to set up projectors properly. Yes, it used to take five days to teach someone how to set up a projector. And how many of you have been in the industry longer than 15 years? And how many of you miss CRT projectors? OK. And, and so we used to spend the whole day prior to that five-day class. A guy by the name of Luke Rawls and I taught that for, for Infocom for the, uh, for the academy, what's now the academy, um, uh, for about seven or eight years. And uh, we would spend the whole day, the day before, setting up two front screen projectors and one rear screen projector like we have here and set it up perfectly so that when the students came in, it would look awesome. One year, we were in Indianapolis. We set up the projectors. We spent all day setting it up. Of course, we always put signs on the projectors, don't touch, because we know the house is going to come in and clean the room. They didn't. They moved the screens. For those of you who don't know what CRT projectors are, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But for those of you who know CRTs, you know the problem with that. So, it was a disaster, but it, we did a real-time example of how to set up a projector in that case. So our, our, what's amazing is here we are in a room with not only really well-lit room, we have two giant lights back there shining on the screen, and we can still see the image. Just 10 years ago, we'd all have to be sitting in the dark, and 20 years ago, we'd have to be sitting in the dark halfway up the room to be able to see this image, right? And, and the other thing is we used to take 640 by 480 and blow it up this big and go, man, that looks awesome. And now 640 by 480 is this many pixels right here. <laughs> and if you blew that up, you'd be like, that looks terrible. Right? So, so it, it is amazing. We do a great job. Our, we've come out with some amazing products as an industry that have solved a lot of problems over the years. I mean, problem solvers where you, you didn't even realize you had problems. And you say, hey, I wish I had a product like this. And all of a sudden, you get the product like this. And you're like, wow, this is amazing what this product does. And we've also had some amazing technologies. And, in the last five years, we've seen an acceleration of technology. For example, there was, a, there was sort of a perfect storm, as an example, of both 4K resolution and laser projection happening at the same time is giant. So if you, for example, if you're a school, you're a corporation out there, and you're still using old-timey projectors that are not laser, let me, let me give you a little hint here. If you take the projector you have, even if it's 1920 by 1080 or even XGA, 1024 by 768. And you pull that out and replace it with another 1024 by 768 projector, which, by the way, will cost half the price of the one you actually originally put in. If you put in a, a laser in that exact same spot, meaning don't change the resolution at all, your perception of resolution will increase somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. Because when you increase colorimetry, the human eye doesn't see that as an increase in colors, they see it as an increase in resolution. So if I give you more colors, you see more resolution as a human, not more colors. Because 
If I said to you, by the way, this image that I'm projecting right has 16 million colors on it, it doesn't matter. Like, you, you, you can't see the 16 million, but there are 16 million colors being represented on this image right now. If I bump this down to 1.6 million, it would look just as good, but the 16 million is not going to look more colorful. It's going to look like a higher resolution image. So what happens is with laser, you significantly increase your colorimetry by incre your resolution by increasing your colorimetry. And then, of course, we add 4K on top of that, four times the resolution of 1080, and we have three-dimensional images popping out of the screen. So that's an example of where technology has moved really, really quickly. So we've done a great job. But what we haven't done a great job at in the industry is focusing on the people and the way the people are impacting and interfacing with the product. Some companies have, most manufacturers have, some integrators have, most integrators have, haven't done a great job of that, and some customers have. So when, and you think about when you're designing a classroom for a university, you have three different sets of customers at a minimum there, right? You have the person who's gonna use it, and in the case of a university, that's multiple people that are gonna actually use it. And by the way, I teach in a room where somebody comes in, I actually teach in a room that someone still uses a document camera, and I'm like, what the, like, why is this document camera on every time I go in there? And no offense to the document camera manufacturers, but I mean, we, we put a document camera in every room, and we could have put one on a cart and just moved it around when you needed it, rather than putting one in every room. And, uh, and, and then that same person that's using a document camera is intimidated by some of the newer technologies that we have in the room. But then we also have the AV people who design the room as customers. And then we also have the financial people who decide whether or not we can buy this stuff or not as customers. We have three different sets of customers. And so those are three different people needs and sort of impacted by different technologies and products out there. And so what I'm gonna challenge you to do today is to focus on the people first instead of the products and the technology. Because we've solved the products and technology problem. There's, we have something for everything, but we need to change the way that we focus and look at the people because the people are gonna impact our, our, our uh, environments more than anything we've ever had impacted really quickly. This example that I gave you of what the difference between you know, Generation Z and a millennial is. So, Generation Y, Millennial, Generation Z, Generation Z. We haven't come up with a nickname for them yet because they are just now hitting college. They're now finished their, uh, some of them have finished their uh, sophomore year, or junior year in college and some of them are uh, still in their sophomore year of college. And then we have uh, Generation Y, the Millennials. So let's define what those generations are so that you know, uh, you know who's who here. Now, I know the AV guys in the back are really pissed at me. I'll tell you why. Because they put this microphone right here in the middle and I moved it to the right, okay? And they are sitting there going, what did he do? Because he keeps turning his head to the left and the microphone goes down. So I know they're gonna be really happy if I move this over to the left a little bit. That make you guys happy? You guys waving back? Look, they're waving at me back there. They are not happy with the fact that I changed the makeup here. So we cannot blame it on them. You can only blame it on me. So I apologize. Is that better? I'm gonna try to pull that wire down. Okay, so we have boomers, right? In Generation X, which this room is filled with. And then we have Millennials and Generation Z. So Millennials started being born in approximately 1981, and Generation Z started in approximately 1996. Now there's not, there's not clear lines here, and in fact, when we all grew up, we were all told generations are 20 to 25 years. Well, you can see that doesn't compute, right? And what we found that there, we found that we have created micro generations based on things and factors that have happened in the world over their lifetime. So again, we've created micro generations based on things and factors that happen in the world during their lifetime. And I'm gonna explain what some of those are. Okay, so I'm gonna first, and, 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 and as a professor, I'm required to do research at the university and I engage the students to do the research. So one of the things I'm doing in the university is I'm really focusing on, by the way, I teach advertising, branding, and marketing at the University of North Carolina. So I'm in the business school and I'm in the School of Media and Journalism. So just a, a cross between both sides to give you an idea as to where I come from. Um, and then, uh, to, to, it, so all of this is based on the research that we've done, and I've got a tremendous amount of research, and then we've sort of narrowed it down to the stuff that matters in this world, all right, so I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to give you both data points and where we got the data points or why that, that data point actually exists. So for example, in the case of millennials, okay, millennials, and how many of you have um, kids that are millennials possibly in here, okay, right? How many of you have kids that are Generation Z? Excellent, so I have both groups in here. So millennials are very idealistic and focused on adventures. If you look at their, their uh, Instagram uh, posts and you talk to them about what 
they want to do over the summer, right? They're not talking about getting a second job. They're talking about going and taking a trip, right? They're talking about having fun. They're not talking about buying a car. They're talking about instead of spending money on a car, spending money on a trip. Like they want to have adventures. They want to enjoy themselves. They're not thinking about tangible things. They're thinking about intangible fun. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to come... I'm going to kind of uh, explain why that is that case, okay? Here's, the, here's why this happened with generation, here's some basic data as to why this happened with Generation Y or Millennials. Remember, 1981 to 1995, so these are people born between 19, so they're all like 37 years old now, right, all the way down to about 23 years old, all right, or 22 years old. All right, so Generation Y, Millennials, they were raised by baby boomers. Think about the way you as a baby boomer think. They grew up during an economic boom. The baby boomers' kids never saw a, a, a not an incredible economy. They only grew up, meaning their, their formative years, where they were starting to receive money from their parents, starting about 8 or 10 years old, and through college, they never grew up in a time where, the, where we had any sort of recession or decline. It was always awesomeness all the time. They do remember 9-11, so they know what it's like to have a significant event happen that could change your life forever rather than being focused on only success. And they were mobile pioneers. And so what I mean by mobile pioneers, they struggled through this product. So this is the worst performing consumer electronics product in history, also the most used consumer electronic product in history. They were the pioneers, right? I mean, think about this product. If you're driving down the road and your car just shut off, would you turn to your spouse and say, hey, the car cut off and turn it back on and just drive on? Well, that's exactly what you do when a phone call gets disconnected. It's like no big deal, right? We just turn it, we just turn it back on or we just reconnect the phone call, right? If, you, if that happened, I'll, I'll step it down. I mean, because a car is kind of a, if a car cut off, of course you'd probably do something about it. But if, if your TV just cut off while you're watching, in the middle of watching a program or froze up, would you be like, uh, oh, okay, well, let me just restart it and just move on, right? You'd be like, no, I'm taking the damn thing back to Best Buy. This is crazy. It's not supposed to happen. This is not normal. But this happens with this product, and you're like, it's completely okay. They, they were the pioneers. They were the ones that sort of struggled through that and, and, and were okay with sort of the, the trade-offs of performance and efficiency. Generation Z, this group of kids that are right underneath them age-wise are focused on saving and pragmatic. They're not looking at vacations. They're very practical, focused on savings, and there's a reason for that. They were raised by Generation X. They grew up during a recession, right? remember 2008, and they don't remember 9-11. It's not even, they only, the only thing they remember is what you tell them about 9-11. They weren't even alive in that case, and they were mo the mobile natives, meaning they, meaning they didn't struggle, they didn't know a time where this wasn't just the normalcy of operation. They even never knew perfection. They always knew good enough. They didn't need perfection, they needed good enough. They, didn't, they don't strive for perfection, they're striving for what is good enough. And so that, that's a different mindset than those of us who remember when everything worked right, and that you could take it back when it didn't work right and get it and take it back again until it finally worked right, right? That doesn't exist in their world. So they're raised by a different type of person, which creates something interesting, all right? So let's take, let's take a look at some data between uh, the, this uh, age group that might surprise you, some, some little factors that I'm going to flip back to later on in the presentation. So interestingly enough, if you look at the People that are teenagers in 1994, you look at the decline of teenagers in alcohol usage in 19, uh, now versus 1994. Check out sex. And there's an interesting factor here. From 1976 to now, look, it's declining among teenagers. How about driver's license? It's declining. Now think about those three factors and the, fa and the impact that's going to have on hu huge economical impact it's going to have on and the trickle-down effect of all of this. Because, I mean, you think of stuff like this, this Generation Z, there's a, there's a giant chunk of them that will probably never own a car. Now, if you sat down and thought about the actual cost of owning a car versus taking an Uber every time you needed a car, I bet 25% of you, at least our data shows, about 25% of you would be actually better served with Uber than ever buying a car. When you add in the cost of the car, right, the cost of the insurance and the cost of the gas, and the, and the, and the inconvenience slash convenience factor, meaning if you're taking another mode of transportation, you can actually work. So your efficiency level actually goes up, or you can do something else. 
You're not supposed to do something else when you're actually driving. So you add in those four factors, and all of a sudden, you have a generation that's thinking logically, like, why would I buy a car when I can just kind of Uber everywhere? And I don't look at that as an important purchase because I don't want to be burdened down with those ultimate costs and the liability that are encompass that level of cost, right? So that's just one example. I, I, I'll go back to the sex example. I have a friend. Anybody ever been to Chapel Hill, North Carolina? So if you've been to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, you've been to Top of the Hill, which is the place that everyone goes when they go to Chapel Hill. It's this bar in downtown Chapel Hill. And a friend of mine owns this bar. And he said something to me interesting. He's friends, of course, with the other big five restaurant slash bar places in Chapel Hill. And he said, six years ago, we can actually track the data. Now versus six years ago, we have 50% the number of people coming out on, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, which are the big party nights. Chapel Hill, North Carolina is a college town. It's where the University of North Carolina is. Tar Heels, okay. Seven national championships, something like that. Anyway, uh, we, the, 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 you actually, um, they can actually track the decline six years ago of, uh, of each year, steady decline of people going out and hanging out at bars, and the ones that do come out are going out later and later at night, meaning it used to be sort of an average of like 10 p.m. Now it's an average of like 12.30 a.m. over a course of six years. Who can remember what happened or what debuted six years ago next month? Starts with a T. Exactly. Tinder. So here's an app that com not just changed the dating world, but changed the entire going out at night, spending money on alcohol, buying food, and meeting people world. So the trickle-down effect of that is very interesting. Again, these are mobile natives in the case of Generation Z, so they've never known a time where that wasn't normalized, and the concept of actually going out and meeting somebody that way is odd. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who raise your hands that have millennials or Generation Z, you'll say, hey, and I have two daughters, one that graduated from college last weekend. Congratulations to her last weekend. She just graduated from college. How about a round of applause for my daughter, Annabelle? And then one that just finished her freshman year at Pepperdine University uh, a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and, and when you ask them, uh, I'll say to my daughters, hey, you didn't call me back. And they're like, yeah, I did. I'm like, no, you didn't. And they're like, my, my daughter's like, I texted you. I'm like, that's not the same as calling. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Like, wh why do you need me to call you back? I answered your question through text. For them, talking on the phone and a text conversation are identical. It's the same thing. We look at it as shifted. Like, we look at it as like a totally different thing. Like, talking's up here and texting's way down here. For them, it's the same thing. So think about... And I'm, as you can see, I'm kind of getting closer to why this matters. Because when you talk about electronics gear and you're talking about connectivity and your collaboration, it's the same thing to them where we look at them as being different than actually being there in person. All right, so some other data points here that are interesting with regard to Generation Z. 98% of them own a smartphone. 80% feel distressed when away from their devices. 87% have access to high-speed internet at home. How many of you remember uh, internet like this? Right, yeah, right? Yeah, how many remember that noise? Okay. You should do that to a generation Z. They're like, what are you talking about? 50% um, are online 10 hours per day. I didn't spell that correctly. 70% uh, watch two or, two or more. I shouldn't have pointed it out. You wouldn't have noticed. But 70% watch two hours of YouTube per day. Now, what's interesting about YouTube, and I teach advertising, so I know a lot about linear advertising, nonlinear advertising, and, I, and, and in fact, this week in New York is the big buying convention um, where they buy all the ads for the upcoming seasons of television shows. Um, and YouTube is interesting because Generation Z, to them, YouTube is a channel, just like ABC, NBC, and CBS was for us, right? And when the president would speak, when I was a kid on ABC, they were on NBC, CBS, and PBS. There was nothing to do, right, because they wanted to watch the president. So then now YouTube, that never happens, right? It's never offline. It's always there. They're, like, literally being entertained all the time. And uh, they're, they admit, 40% of them admit they're addicted to their phone, but they don't care. That's not a big deal to them. That's an issue that you have, not an issue that they have. And a goldfish a goldfish's attention span is technically 12 seconds, and a Generation Z is uh, 8 seconds. And, 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 and in reality, you're guilty of this too. If you use Instagram or Facebook and you see an ad for something that has the learn now button on it and you click it and you see that thing starting to count up, if it doesn't move to the ad quick enough or doesn't move to the, the site fast enough, you X out and go back. 
So we're all guilty of this attention span problem. Five, six seconds is about the most that we'll wait for something to load like that, or we just kind of go back and say, I don't want to go there. All right. 62% um, will not use an app or website that's hard to navigate. Think about that. How many of your websites are hard to navigate? How many of your websites aren't mobile friendly? How many of your websites aren't mobile first? Because both millennials and Generation Z, they're on their phone significantly more than they're on a desktop or a laptop computer. So responsive websites are a big deal. 62% will not use an app or website that's loading too slowly. And 66% frequently use more than one device at the same time, known as multitasking. I have a great example of that. My daughter, who just graduated from college last weekend, when she was a junior, sophomore or junior in high school, I went into her, now maybe I should back up and give you a little bit of context. Um, for a couple of weeks prior to this day, she was breaking down at night, talking about how overloaded she was. She was a year-round swimmer, pretty high-performing year-round swimmer. Um, she was uh, taking, she took eight AP classes in high school, which is probably a lot. And then also, you know, was obsessed whenever she didn't make an A. So she was sort of a high-performing kid, put a lot of pressure on herself. And she, but she would never go to bed before midnight or one or sometimes two o'clock in the morning. Talk about how exhausted she was. So put that in context. There have been two weeks of meltdowns off and on over that. And I'm sure you've, if you have kids, you know exactly what I mean by a meltdown. Starts at about two years old and moves forward. Uh, it doesn't finish until about 23, by the way. Uh, and in any case, I walk into her room one day, and she's got a headset on. So it looks like she's playing video games, like you know, one of those headsets with video games. She's, she's inside of Second Life, and I'm like, what is going on here? She's got her TV on, right, in her room, and she's playing music separately on the TV all at the same time. And she looks up at me, because like 11 o'clock, I'm like, go to bed. This is the problem. You're playing video games, and this is why you're exhausted at night. And she goes, no, I'm doing my homework. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, we're having a meeting in Second Life. All of us, the students in this group project we're working on, this is how we meet. And I'm like, what? And it shocked me. And, it, and it, the, at the time, you know, I didn't put two and two together, but I, of course, turned the TV. Actually, I unplugged the TV and took it out of a room. And I unplugged the speaker and took it out of the room, and I said, you need to single task, not multitask at this point in time, because you need to go to bed before midnight. And then literally two, week in, uh, two weeks later, in the personal journal section of the Wall Street Journal, I open up, and the front page of the personal journal section is a 20-year-long study that they had done on high school kids and their performance in college, and how the ones that were multitasking in high school were performing better than the ones that weren't multitasking in high school when they got to college. So I went back and put her TV back, and I put back her <laughs> radio back, and I left her alone. And she did well. She actually freaked out with her one uh, C that she got in college. So she, she actually did pretty well in college. Now, there's a place where Generation Y and Generation Z are the same. There's this overlap where they think exactly the same way, right? And so that we're going to talk about some of those uh, factors now. The first is simplicity. Anything that is hard to use, they're not going to use it. If it isn't simple to use, they're not going to use it. So complicated control systems that require more than one or two button presses, good luck. So anyone under the age of 37 is just going to walk away from that. Or they're going to blame any problems with a system on that type of an interface. They want to be able to, they, they have the ability, I mean, think about how complicated this is. Like, for example, there are apps you can't even figure out how to use, which come with no instructions that they use like crazy, known as Snapchat, and you can't figure out how to use it. And there are no instructions because they don't want old people to know how to use it. <laughs> That's intentional. And they figured out how to use it without any instructions. Literally, no instructions came with it. And they know all the key commands and ways to press your screen in weird ways to get different things to appear. Did you know that you can get inside Snapchat, you can hold down a place inside Snapchat anytime music is playing anywhere publicly, and it will tell you who, who wrote the song, who sung the song, and how to buy the song. Built into Snapchat. But they, and any kid that knows how to use Snap knows how to use that feature. Did you know that inside Snap, you can press someone's name, and you can see exactly where they're located in the world on a map? Right? Again, no instructions, and they figured out how to use that feature. They want simplicity. And so if, your rooms, if you think your rooms are simple, you need to have a 19 or a 23 or 28-year-old walk in. Don't tell them at all what the room does and see if they can figure out how to use it. Because if they can't figure out how to use it, it's not simple. 
So simplicity is super important. So when you're out there on the show floor, make sure you're looking for products that are, that are truly simple. They're simplifying things, not complicating things. Second is collaboration. This is completely normal to them. We look at collaboration as something new. This is normal to them. They've been collaborating since they were young in both generations. They, for them, FaceTime is good enough. They've been, they've been communicating and talking with their friends through Skype and FaceTime with their phones forever since the beginning of the time that they had phones. We look at that as that's low resolution miniature imaging. I'm not gonna use something like that. We wanna put real life size or life size proportion people in front of us. And in their case, they're collaborating with five people at one time on a cell phone screen. And it's perfectly fine with them. They don't need all this other stuff. And they walk into a room with a device that they need the ability to collaborate with that room with as natural, not added on. So you can't look at collaboration as an add-on to a room, it has to be naturally integrated into a room. Third is digital first. Nothing should be analog first, it should be completely digital first, meaning everything's gotta start from that device that they're used to using. Whatever that device is, Android, iPhone, tablet, it could be even a laptop for some of the older millennials. They're, 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 they're in some cases, uh, that includes uh, a, a laptop. But they are mobile first for the most part. In, in the case of both Generation Y and Generation Z, mobile first. And if you look at them, you'll see that's where they're spending most of their time. And, and what's cool about that is with the new operating system with, with, uh, with iOS, with the iPhone, it'll tell you how much time you spend on every single app and what you're doing. And you'll see that the amount of time you're spending on this is significantly longer than the amount of time you're spending on your desktop computer, your laptop, or, or any other device that you might have. So they're very much mobile first. So therefore, that interface to the room has to be based on this device, not based on some other device in the room. And this is a weakness, for example, right now in the world of video collaboration because all the video collaboration rooms require a computer. Bad idea. So we're only a few months away from solving that problem technologically, maybe eight months away from solving it product-wise. So we have a technology issue and we have a product issue um, that will solve that. So, but because you have to put a computer in the room, the computer can't be the thing that's in the room. The thing that's in the room has to be intangible, meaning the, the user interface to that collaboration system has to be mobile first. It's just an example, that's just one example. Um, real time, they don't want delay. So it's simple and also real time. So they don't want, their, their, there's no reason for that not to be real time. And again, an example of that is where I teach at UNC, in my classroom I have two systems running simultaneously in my classroom. I have Vadio cameras connected to Extron SMPs, which are, you know what Vadio cameras are? Those are like, uh, you know, just, they are uh, uh, PTZ cameras that can follow me around, they recognize me when I walk in the room. As soon as I walk in the room, they start operating. It tells the, P the SMP, which is a streaming media box that Extron makes, that streams to Facebook Live and to Panopto and uh, records it on a hard drive at the same time. As soon as I walk in the room, it knows I'm in the room. Wherever I walk, it follow the cameras follow me. It's streaming my class, right, in real time and also recording the class. And the other system I have is Zoom through Panacast 2 cameras so that anyone who joins the room that's in their dorm room can see the entire room, see who's in the room, and I can see them in life-size proportions for the most part. So when they ask a question, they wave at me and they answer the question. So I have those systems running simultaneously in real time. So that way a student who can't come to class can come to class wherever they are. If they're sick in the dorm, they're back in their apartment, they're out of town because they have an athletic event, because there's a, there may be an athlete or something, they can join class at any given time, in real time. Or they can, of course, watch the recording that the, that the Vadio system and the SMP. So this is a complicated system that is simple from a user interface standpoint, because for them, they're using devices that they're naturally used to, right? They're just all you have to do is when the class starts, Zoom sends a notification on your phone saying class is starting, and they open up Zoom and the class starts. They don't have to remember that class starts because it's part of the calendar program that's built into Zoom, which is built into everyone who's a member of the class, which they register at the beginning of the semester. So if I, if I cancel class, Zoom, of course, isn't gonna start up. It's gonna know I cancel class, so it's not gonna send them a notification that I cancel class. So therefore, they don't have to worry about watching class. Does this make sense? Do you see where I'm going with this? It's all built in 
thanks to the integrator that did that work. All right, visual. They like visual imaging. They like to see visuals. They, they want to be connected. If you, you look at any of you that have kids that are in this age demographic, you see that already, that they're, they are vi very visual in the way that they, uh, they love watching, for example, music videos on YouTube. So they're kind of like back to the 80s, like when we all used to gather around a TV because Michael Jackson was coming out in the new video and we watched, or Madonna, was kind of watching a new video and we'd sit around and watch it. And that kind of went away for a while. So they're actually listening to music on YouTube because it has the music video along with it while doing homework and also collaborating with their friends at the same time. And, then, and also for them, online and in real life are the same thing. There is no difference between online life and in real life. To them, they're the same thing. So anything that they can do to, to communicate with the world online is the equivalent of them communicating with the world in real life. Like the example I gave you of them text my kids texting me saying, I did contact you, I did answer your question, when I wanted a phone call. So for them, it's the exact same thing. So their level of communication is the same. And, uh, and, and so therefore, that's just the way that they operate. It's a different mindset than what we have. I, another, a, sort of another uh, a, a, you know, side note de, uh, example is when I started working at Extron, uh, like I said, 1987, um, the president of the company said, I'm going to pay for golf lessons for you, which I hated golf. But I, I was gonna, gonna pay, and he's like, you got to learn how to play golf because that's how all business is done, right? Because you can have a customer who can lie to you for an hour on the phone, but they can't lie to you for four hours in person. And that's how long it takes, that's how long it takes to, to play golf is four hours. And by the way, they've sped up the game, so now it only takes three hours and 50 minutes in case you want to still play golf. Um, but in any case... In their case, you, this is the reason why golf is dying. Because for them, like, what, four hours? I mean, this is crazy. I don't need to do that in, in real life when I can communicate and collaborate with those customers and have the same relationship with them in an online world that you did in a real life world. It's the same thing. So they're getting a different, they're getting the same benefit from that perspective of online and real life being the same thing. So now, so... This all begs the question, what difference does this make, and why, do you, why should you care about this, and sort of how do you integrate this thought process and the way that they think into the systems that you're designing for your customers or for yourself? Um, so there's some things going on that you should be aware of that, that, uh, that, that will help answer those questions. First is, you should be building systems that are walk up and use experiences. So I'm gonna give you some sort of hints of things to do. What I mean by that is, I can walk, there is no instructions, not even a laminated piece of paper there that says do this if you have any problems. Literally, it should be a walk up and use experience. I literally walk up to it and can figure out how to use it. So uh, on the show floor, I walk around the show floor to kind of get an idea of where you could go and see this. If you go to the Crestron uh, booth on the show floor and you look at the, the Flex product they have there, it's a walk up and use experience. They're using the Zoom interface, or they use a Skype interface, or the Microsoft Teams interface, which you'd be familiar with because it's on all the devices that you have, but it can, that same interface can be used to control the room, for example, right? The, the S&P example that I gave you from Extron for the streaming video box is another example of that kind of a walk up and use experience. Second is, everything needs to be connected. There's nothing that they want to not connect to at any moment in time, even things that are disparate that don't seem like they need to be connected together, they have an expectation that they can be connected together. So for example, there are apps. One of them is called Amazon. How many of y'all have Amazon on your phone? Okay, okay. So that Amazon app will actually track your grocery list for you so that when you go to the grocery, you have your grocery list always available to you, whether or not you buy it from Amazon or not. And if you go into a Whole Foods, it will, actually send you a push notification to remind you of your grocery list that they're keeping for you in the app. Th that's a good example of disparate things that are made to work together. Like no one would have thought five years ago there'd be any reason for Amazon app to talk to a grocery store or, for any of the, or to keep an, a, a grocery list for any reason whatsoever. So we need the devices to talk together. So meaning I should be able to access my classroom, they should be able to get into my classroom with a walk up and use experience all the time. So the classroom, for example, has the same meeting ID 
all the time. They don't have to relearn the meeting ID for every single time we have class. It's always the same meeting ID, so they don't have to, to remember what that meeting ID is. It's all completely automated for them. And, and that's because everything is connected to the network. And that's just going to be a normal thing. They want native collaboration. They don't want that collaboration added on. They want it to be native in everything that they do. And they're already doing that now. I mean, this is a generation of kids that grew up on Google Docs, which allows you to connect to anything anywhere else that anyone else is working on simultaneous. Now, a lot of your organizations, you want to push them over to Microsoft apps. But in reality, you're going to figure out how to work with Google Docs and Microsoft apps, because they're not going to switch. They're just going to leave your company. So whether or not you like that, that's what's going to happen. And then you have that subset of them that also work in the iCloud environment, where you're trying to push them over to Exchange or Outlook, and they don't want to do that. They want to stay in the iCloud environment. So you have to make everything work together and collaborate together so that everyone is happy. And, and the security issues that used to exist there don't exist, because things have been rapidly moving quick enough that we've solved a lot of those problems. And that's the advantage of a company like AVI. They can help you do that kind of stuff. Next is they want active learning rooms or active meeting rooms. So this is my classroom at UNC. I'm going to use this as an example again a little bit later. Um, you'll notice I have no screen. No offense to Dale Ivory, the screen manufacturer. I just painted a giant white box on the wall. And the whole wall can basically be a digital uh, 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 canvas. I can project anywhere I want, anytime I want. I can project whatever content that I want. And of course, I have, uh, this is a Nareva span. Nareva's on the show floor there. Uh, in there, but everything is wireless and everything is mobile. Nothing is permanent. Even the even the podium, all that is on wheels. That's battery operated. Uh, all the furniture is on wheels, obviously, and everything is wirelessly connected together. And so there's no wires. Uh, nothing is is permanently mounted, and we can re re configure the room on the fly for class projects versus lecture environment versus uh, um, them working in in separate pods with each other. And, and we can, there is no front of the room. There's also two uh, Epson light scene projectors in here. If you haven't gone to the Epson booth, those are like the greatest new projection technology, probably the coolest new projection technology I've ever seen. Um, and, 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 and if you go to the booth, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, so therefore, we can project on any room at any time. So that we can make the front of the room, the, room, the front of the room at any moment in time. This is active learning. I mean, I can engage people wherever they are, and they're constantly engaged. And by the way, You'll notice that you probably can't, I don't have a, is there a laser pointer on this? There's not. So do you see the word aura image? To the left of that, do you see that little white thing hanging on the wall right there? Now, now, now this building, by the way, is 100 years old. This classroom is 50, this classroom is in the basement of a, uh, a classroom that had not been renovated for 50 years. All the walls are concrete. So this is like the worst possible environment to build a classroom, and we pulled it off. So everything's external. But um, you'll notice that, that that little bar, that is a microphone speaker array. So that thing is on all the time. And any time a student speaks in the class, the students that are watching distance learning wise can hear and listen and understand what the student is saying no matter where they're sitting in the room. The thing has the ability to pick up the room in a, in a 35 foot deep room by 40 foot wide room completely. So I can literally come over here, stand in the corner, turn away from it and talk in my normal tone of voice and it will pick me up. And if someone is opening a bag of chips on the other side of the room, it will block that out. So you're only hearing the person talking, not the ba bag of chips rumbling, rumbling. So you go over to the Nareva booth and, and check that out. It's called the HDL 300. All right. They want reconfigurable rooms, sort of like what I just talked about in just a second. They, won't, they don't want that permanent sort of environment. And, and interestingly enough, there is a little bit of a difference here between millennials and Generation Z that we're finding. Millennials like working in large groups, and, and Generation Z likes working alone, but collaborating uh, online. So they don't mind working those large groups, but they want everyone to be connected online. Millennials want everybody to be working in open office environments and be constantly talking to each other all the time. So that's a little bit of a difference there between the, those two groups. Uh, next is allow for recasting. This is a cool feature that didn't exist even two years ago, but does exist now. So for example, the Intel Unite system allows you to, and I use it in my classroom, all my PowerPoint slides, or key, in my case I use Apple Keynote, slides like these are pushed to any device that people have in the room. So they don't have to take notes. 
They don't have to look at the screen in the front of the room if they don't. As soon as I change slides, those slides are pushed to any device they have in the room. So whether they're using an iPhone, an Android phone, a laptop, a tablet, the, the slides are recasted to them simultaneously to be being pushed up on the screen up front, and that's all software-based. And they log into it one time at the beginning of the semester, and any time I present, the slides come to them, they can take screenshots of the slides, or they can even annotate on the slides using whatever annotation program they have built into their computer. So that's known as recasting. Um, make BYOD EASY, because one of the problems we have is a lot of these BYOD connection devices, these wireless presentation devices, are H-A-R-D. <laughs> so just because you're doing wireless presentation and wireless connectivity doesn't mean it's simple to do. This has to be really simple. You can't say, okay, go download this app and then type in this detail and then you can, it can't be like that. It's gotta be native into the wireless system that they're already using now. So it's gotta be simple from that standpoint. Create a digital canvas. So here's an example of how we create a digital canvas and how a digital canvas is used in a classroom. So in this case, we have two projectors. So one projector is projecting from here to halfway over. The other projector is projecting the other half. Both are 4K projectors. And I'm able to show my current slide, my previous slides, and no student has to say, well, can you go back and review those slides or I'm uh, behind? Of course, we're recasting too, but all my content is up at the same time. So if I'm gonna show a YouTube video and during class, I don't switch between my content, PowerPoint to YouTube. I keep it up all the time and it's big enough that I've created this giant digital canvas which, by the way, we couldn't have done this five years ago because, yes, technically you could do it at 1080p, but it would look terrible. With 4K, everything is in, in its native resolution. I don't make 4K slides. My slides are native, just like these, 1920 by 1080, which is what these were made in. So when you project that slide in the current slide box, it is a 1920 by 1080 native resolution slide. So everything's being showed in its native resolution. I'm just creating a big, large digital canvas that I can use. And so instead of thinking about just projecting a single piece of content, why not project all of it all the time? Now, for anyone over the age of 40, you'd be like, whoa, this is just too much. <laughs> There's too much going on here. But think about everything I've just told you. They're multitasking. They're used to collaboration. They, they want to they have access to all this all the time. And just ask your kids, you know, watch them play a video game. Try to figure out how to use more than two or three buttons on that controller. There's nine buttons on the average video game controller, and they're working all nine buttons. At best, most of us in the room, myself included, might be able to run three or four of those at the same time. But in their case, it's fine. This is not a problem. And of course, I, since I have lots of extra space, I also project a clock and Twitter feed and, and uh, Instagram feed sometimes. Next is send content anywhere. That content should be available anywhere I want to send that content. Not just recasting to the students in the room, but I should be able to send that content wherever they are, right? So, and you can. That's the nice thing about content sharing in any of these video collaboration systems, like, like Zoom is an example I've been using, that they, you have the ability to send the content anywhere. Yes, it isn't perfect, meaning the resolution isn't perfect. But either is this. If they're watching TV, on, do you know what the resolution of watching TV on this is like once it's being streamed through data? It's terrible, but this is good enough. I mean, who would have thought, Hollywood never would have thought people would watch TV shows on it. If you'd have said to Hollywood 15 years ago, the future of your industry is everyone's gonna be watching on four inch diagonal screens, and be like, you gotta be kidding me. We're making bigger and bigger TVs all the time and we're building IMAX theaters all over the place because people want to see images bigger. And every once in a while they do. Like, who wants to see Endgame on a screen like this? Not the first time, but maybe the second, third, and fourth time they would see it on a screen like this, right? So, but, but everything else, we're looking at a screen like this and it's perfectly fine. Um, interactivity. I think this is the mo one of the most underrated features of our industry right now is the fact that we can make anything interactive. It doesn't have to be a LCD monitor with built-in interactivity. We can take a projected surface and make it interactive just by adding an overlay onto that surface or by using technology that allows me to make this interactive. And I can even make it interactive through gesture controls if I wanted to, right? I mean, I, there, are, there are companies in our industry that you can do like this and the volume will go up and do like this, the volume will go down, do like this, the switch inputs. 
right? Do like this, it'll turn on. Do like this, it'll turn off. So we have the ability to make things interactive and logical in the way that we, that we interact with the, the content and the, and the way that things are presented to us. And then this whole thing about uh, auto-archiving. We should have the ability to have people recall everything that we're presenting to them or every meeting that we do or every content that is shared in a meeting on the fly all the time. And we have the ability to do that now that we have cloud-based services. So we're going to see our industry leverage AV cloud-based services in a bigger way, and you can take advantage of that now. So this is all stuff that exists now. Some of this stuff is emerging, but all of it is available. And then start thinking about ecosystems, meaning sticking, it's okay to stick with one manufacturer and have a trade-off because you do. Meaning I don't have to pick the best of the best and build a room out of the best of the best. Sometimes I'm, I make my most important piece the best, and this company makes all the other stuff, but it isn't the best, it's good enough. You've created an ecosystem where everything works really well together, and the value of that ecosystem is you know you have one place to go whenever there's a problem, but it all works really well together. Right? I mean, you kind of think about Apple and the way that they kind of created an ecosystem with all their products working well together, and that they happen to make a better watch than anyone else, and they happen to make a better laptop than anyone else, but they don't necessarily make the better the best phone, right? But it's a good trade-off because it's all synced together. I don't have to worry about syncing my contacts because my contacts are always available to me even though their phone isn't exactly the best phone. Like they were two generations earlier, Samsung had a waterproof phone. Two years later, Apple finally comes out with a waterproof phone. So they don't always have the best, but it works well within that ecosystem. So let's quickly go through seven things that are happening in the future here, because I only have 15 minutes left, that you should be aware of uh, that will affect your business um, real quickly. Won't take that long, take five minutes to go through these. First is AV over IP. This is the fastest moving technological development in our industry's history. How fast the industry is moving from analog and digital signal routing to network-based signal routing. So the AV over IP is basically the ability to take content, everything we're doing now, video, audio, control, network, and power, and power, and send it across the network. And that way I can pick that content up anywhere it is. Well, we have that ability now. There are a number of companies on the show floor there that make AV over IP transmitters and receivers or on-ramps and off-ramps, whatever you want to uh, uh, call them. And as I said at the University of North Carolina, we're doing that. We're converting the entire campus to AV over IP about, uh, with the exception of maybe uh, a, a dozen rooms, we have about 355 rooms on campus, but with the exception of maybe a dozen rooms, they're all going to be one gig AV over IP or H.264. And we have a few rooms, like I said, about a dozen that will be 10 gig. Right? You think about the application for 10 gig, where you're doing less compression. I don't want to go into the technical parts of that, but if, if it, where you're doing less compression would be like the graphic design department, medical imaging for the medical school, um, and uh, art department, things like that. But, but teaching chemistry and biology and English, they don't need that kind of stuff. They just need to have a laptop or have a, have a customer come in or professor come in and plug up their data and it just appears on the wall or the screen in the room. That's all they really need to have done. This is all going to be significantly simplified because we finally have true plug and play. We finally have true plug and play. We have one connector that the entire world is going to standardize on that you're going to see everywhere known as USB-C. So we now going to have finally have worldwide interactive, interoperable plug and play connectivity. So everything's going to have that ability to do that thanks to USB-C. So you're going to see an acceleration of that uh, and finally the realization of true plug and play. Next is what I call the content player. How many of you know how digital signage works? OK, that's good, about half of you. So for those of you who don't know, the simple explanation is we're sending content as a file across the network, just like emailing somebody a file. So you imagine you, I could email this presentation to you, and you get it, and then you just have to download it. Right? Depending on how big the presentation is would determine how long it takes to download it. This particular one, I don't have any video in it, so it's only about, this presentation is only about, uh, I think, in the range of uh, 1.6 gig is the size of this presentation. So I email that to you, and five minutes later, you could download it, and you'd have that presentation. You could play it wherever you want to play it. That's how digital science works. We send the content to the monitor, which has a media player built into it, which is basically like a purpose-built PC. 
built into it that plays the content. There's three ways to play that content. One is stream it live, right, which we do now, right? We stream live all the time, right? How many of you have an Apple TV or a Roku kind of box? That's streaming live. That's a, that's a media player, right? It isn't totally live. You think it's live, but it's not really live. Apple's playing it, and you're seeing it six seconds later. But since you don't have a, you don't have a reference to what the original source was, six seconds is perfectly fine with you. But if I was sitting in the same room and the original source was running and the delayed source was running, which is what H.264 is, you'd be like, that ain't going to work. So we couldn't use H.264 in that application. We'd have to use one gig in that application. So one way is streaming. Second way is we send the content to the media player, and the media player downloads it and then reloads or writes over the old content at like 2 or 3 in the morning when nobody's walking around an airport looking at these monitors for critical information. And then the next day, the content is new and plays on the, on the screen. The third way is to embed a thin client player in all these devices and actually allow them to play the content on the fly based on where the content came from. So think about this. This is the future. This is the content player. It works exactly the way your Zoom rooms or Skype rooms or Microsoft Teams rooms work now. Think about this. You invite people to a meeting. It knows who's at the meeting. Any content that's shared at the meeting, we know the content that needs to be shared because the person just worked on it. We know who's leading the meeting. We know who's in the meeting. As long as that device, i.e. the projector in this case, has the ability to pull that content off the network and play it, we don't need a PC in the room. So the future of our industry is going to be content players, thin client content players built into the devices. So all of our content will be sent across the network rather than having analog and digital video ports sitting there all the time needing to be used. Third, and the next thing is signage, signage everywhere. You're going to see, finally, we're going to get to an environment where we're going to see signage everywhere because the advertising industry has now adopted the standards of the signage industry, which is going to mean that we're going to see signage all over the places because we're getting closer to having a signage me uh, metric for impressions, right? So it's going to be accelerated thanks to the advertising industry, which means that we'll be able to put content wherever we want to put it all the time. If you remember that scene where Tom Cruise is running in Minority Report and there's, they're projecting on the street, they're projecting on the walls, they're projecting on the side of the buildings, then we're going to get closer to an environment like that. And if you go to a lot of big cities, we already have sort of like that in sort of developing formats. And it'll be ultimately come down to city councils. Where will they allow you to project? Like, are they just going to allow you to put content anywhere? Or are they going to have some limitation based on private spaces or something like that? Next thing is AR-assisted control. You should be thinking about how this is, this is one of the futures of the industry, is AR-assisted control, where, we're, where our students or anyone who may come in to use a room at any moment in time just opens up the camera in their phone and the device, it recognizes the device by seeing a picture of the device and gives you the control of that device because it knows what the device is. So this is a whole different way of controlling something when you need to control an individual device in the room, AR-assisted control. That will lead us to a world where we have AI-assisted rooms where they recognize who we are. Like, how would it recognize who we are? We have a digital leash. We're all walking around with a digital leash. So if we, as long as we give the organization we work for access to that digital leash, or if we have to use ID badges if we want, when we come in the room, it knows what we want to do. Because it knows how we normally use a room, and it sets up the room for us. Interestingly enough, as I said, AVI can already do that for you now. If you, as long as you give them the parameters, of how you want the room to be used and what each person is allowed to do. So I can take a room that is literally outfit with everything you could possibly do in that room, but I could make it where the user interface of the room is only what that particular user needs that interface to be. So we sort of already have this. We would have to do it through some sort of login procedure, right? So we identify who that person is. One way is to have a, everyone has a separate pin code on a control panel. Hit the pin code they get a whole different control panel than someone else who had a pin code with a different code, has a whole different level of control. And we did that, that's how we did at UNC. What we did at UNC was the, we divided it by professors, students, and janitorial service. So the janitorial service has a login that only turns on the lights and doesn't turn on all the AV equipment, allows them to clean, and then it automatically turns the lights off. Students only have access to the stuff that we want them access to, but professors have access to everything. That doesn't always work perfectly because not everybody can use everything. So I'm not going to fool you into thinking it works every time. And this demographic's also going to want to see AR or uh, VR-based meetings. They're going to want to be in the future where they're putting on a headset and they're meeting with you in real-life proportions as if they're sitting in the room right across from you. Because for them, 
this, this generation, especially Generation Z, they're sitting with a headset all the time already. I mean, if you go look at the people that walk into Microsoft Store and that buy the Xbox VR systems or Web VR systems or, or the Oculus uh, Go product, which is a $150 system from uh, Facebook, they're all Generation Z. And they're playing games. The big dominating market for that right now is gaming. And they're, they're putting on these VR headsets and they're playing games in real life proportions and, uh, and they're immersing themselves, I guess is the best way to say it. So if you had a VR meeting environment where you put on a headset and you're actually sitting in the meeting and you're looking around the room like, just like you're actually sitting there, this is where Zoom's going in the future. This is, like, this is why they went public. This is why they needed that $80 billion. Because they're gonna go into this kind of a market where you're simulating the future of a room being exactly like you're actually sitting in in a room. So this is, and it's going to serve Generation Y and Generation Z really well because they're not intimidated by these types of technologies. So I just want to remind you that, as I said, we're going around the show floor and shooting videos on all the products that are in there. So I have about 100 videos. All the educational sessions will all be at raypubs.com slash Live. It's all free. We don't track you. We don't require you to register. So we're not doing anything with your data or anything like that. Uh, and uh, it's a secure site, so it's not like we are, uh, you know, hacking into your system or anything. You're welcome to use it or not. And I uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. And I have a few minutes for questions in case anybody wants to ask any questions or ask me to clarify anything that I covered. Wow, I was that good or that boring? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it, man. As always, excellent. Welcome. Thank you. So I encourage you to get online. Go to ravepubs.com slash AVI Live. There's going to be a lot of information that you can gather from uh, this show and from uh, some others that we do around the country. And it's good information to share and get conversations started with people back at the office and wherever it is that we work and collaborate together.